Gary Muhlberg is the package killer. Thanks to, per- thanks to persistent detectives and DNA evidence, the package killer has finally been identified. Muhlberg is already serving life in prison for the murder of his last victim, but has now confessed to five more murders from 1990 to 1991. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the True Crime Squad. I'm Christy Brower, here with my sister, co-host, and partner in crime, Katie Weaver. Hey, Katie. Hello. How's it going? It's going good. Are you laughing at me because I left a mistake in the intro? I noticed, yeah. (laughs) You guys, can I please tell you that when you have a hysterectomy, it might as well have been um, a brain removal as well. Holy crap, I'm almost four weeks out, and yet my brain has not caught up. And it's not like that's the first time I've made a dumb mistake like that. Uh, Uh, (laughs) Normally, I'm right on top of that shit, but not today. (laughs) Anesthesia, though. It takes forever, I think, to get your wits about you again after anesthesia. Really does. Really does. Yeah. It's forgivable. No worries at all. It is, but, you know, I'm really picky about stuff like that. (laughs) I know. Oh no, I remember making that mistake when I was recording it and then I didn't do anything about it. <laughs> Duh. Oh, oh well, that's all right. It's okay. The, the meat of the story is there. It's such an important one. I cannot wait to it hear is. all about yes. it because wow. Uh, we love it when a serial killer is finally identified. I mean, that is a good thing. So we're... There's been so much serial killer news recently. It's interesting. Tons. All this DNA work is solving and clearing all these cold cases, you guys. Mm-hmm. It just keeps happening. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first, mm-hmm. we have an announcement. We do. We are doing something we've never done before. Mm-hmm. So we want to tell you about it so you don't freak out. But we're taking the majority of next week off. Yeah. We never take a break. You know we don't. No. I'm going on vacation. And uh, Katie has already had to cover a whole week for me because of my surgery. (laughs) And so, you know what? We decided to take a fall break. Kind of. Yeah. I'm going to dig through our archives and find a few of our cases that are relevant to right now that, or ones that I feel like... uh, just deserve a second chance and I'm just mm-hmm. going to, I'm going to pull them back out and re-air them. So there will be content next week and it may mm-hmm. be stuff you haven't heard before. Cause you know, we have a lot of content uh, coming up on 700 hell, episodes. <laughs> maybe I'll even pull some stuff out of our Patreon that Ooh. you have maybe not heard before. I don't know. That I'll decide if idea. you have requests, let me know and I'll, I'll uh, start dusting through the archives. So we will have episodes up. They won't mm-hmm. be brand new and current, but you know, they might still be things that you're interested in. A lot of you guys are new listeners. And a mm-hmm. lot of you came to us because you're listening to the Dave Belvalo case. Because mm-hmm. Or Gabby of, Petito. Mm-hmm. Well, we have a lot of new listeners due to the new uh, Netflix. Uh, right. The Netflix series. doc. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, also, uh, Adnan Sy- Syed. A lot of, we have some new listeners due to that case as well. Yeah. So some of you, we may have something to present that's new to you yet. So that's what's going to happen. But I am going to do case updates. There you go. So I will be live on uh, Wednesday night. That's the only live thing we'll have next week. But I will be here for that. Uh, so watch for it. But yeah, if there's any old cases that we have done or haven't that you haven't seen, reach out. Maybe it's in our oldest Patreon archives and we can pull them out. Yeah. We, so we no sure worries. We there will be content. There will, but we won't be here as Mm -hmm. we will be here, but sort of us from the past. We're going to do a little time traveling. (laughs) You might see our old name, hear some of our old intros, whatever. (laughs) Yeah. Quantum leap, only totally different. Everybody needs a break sometime, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. So I think it's a great idea. It's great. It's perfect. All right. Well, Katie, I know you're going to kick us off with some crime news. Yes.
This is more death penalty news. There's been so much of it the last couple of years. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, whether you are a fan of the death penalty or you're not, or you're on the fence, kind of depending on who we're talking about. I've discovered that's how most people are really. Mm-hmm. Is for the most part, you're like, no, the death penalty is wrong. Or yes, the death penalty is great. Except for in this one case, I can't, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I find most people are kind of there. But there is a case going on right now in Alabama that I think you guys will find very interesting. I certainly did. So I'm going to pull up a picture here for you. We're talking about Alan Eugene Miller. So Alan Eugene Miller uh, committed three murders in 1999. This is Alan. And Alan is scheduled to die this week on Tuesday or on Thursday on September 22nd but in that state they are practicing lethal injection which we know there are a myriad of issues with lethal injection at this point uh, partly because of lethal injection uh, not being as effective as it used to be and creating a lot of undue suffering that is a violation Mm -hmm. of the constitution whether you like that or not it is a violation of the constitution and the drugs have gotten very hard to get. So when lethal injection first became more popular back in the 70s, um, and they started kind of phasing out some other forms of execution, particularly death by cyanide gas poisoning in the gas chamber, um, and and other, you know, things. Firing squad. Firing squad, things that were uh, maybe used or not used. And then, of course, there was a whole federal stay on executions for a while i mean you know there, there's a long rich history rich i don't know if that's the right word history of execution mm-hmm. uh, this isn't an entire book report on that but what happened way back when is that prisons bought up a lot of the medication needed to carry out lethal injection well over the years as those drugs have expired or run out, the companies who make them have gotten a lot more cringed about it, right? They don't really want their drugs to be used to take life. And a lot of uh, advocates and uh, activist groups have fought really hard against the death penalty, have really gone up against these companies and really kind of forced them to go, yeah, we're not approving that drug for death penalties any longer. We know it's been a thing. We know that Idaho actually like did some black market buying of medication several years ago uh, to the tune of 25,000 in one case, 40,000 in another to -hmm. have the meds to put two men to death. Paul Ezra Rhodes and another man in Idaho uh, back in, I think, 2010 and 2011. Since then, Idaho hasn't had an execution because they can't. They just don't have the drugs for it, uh, which hasn't felt stop them from fighting in court uh, viciously to put people to death that are dying of cancer and stupid stuff. But this isn't about Idaho today. Uh, But it is about the death penalty. So we also know that Oklahoma has had a really bad run here lately with executions. They are carrying out an execution a week until mid-2023. It's insanity. Mm. And they're doing what they have which is, well, we thought, lethal injection, right? And they've had a lot of problems. Part of the problem is getting all of the uh, IV lines in. And if people don't have the right veins for them, it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. The other part of it is being able to hire medical personnel that are willing to be a part of this. That has become a huge problem. That's a biggie, yeah. Uh, And then also just the way that person's body responds to the medication and what goes wrong ends up with people taking hours to die, hours of excruciating pain, which I know that some of you are like, well, they caused excruciating pain for others. So why do we care? Well, we care because it's in the Constitution. You know, the Constitution says that death penalty uh, sentences cannot cause undue suffering and i hope we also care because two rights don't make a two wrongs don't make a right 
Yeah. Because you know? who are we as a society? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So with all of that being said, here's what happened in Alabama. So in Alabama, Alan Eugene Miller had applied for death by nitrogen hypoxia. This is brand new. If you've never heard of it before, don't feel bad. You couldn't have. It has not been practiced yet. But a few states have approved it as approved methods of uh, death, but it's not fully in place yet. So his team had said he does not want to die via lethal injection. He wants to die via this method. And if states have different methods on the books, prisoners do have the right to make a choice. Mm -hmm. Well, there was some hullabaloo with the Department of Justice who claimed that they never received a filing saying that he wanted to die by nitrogen hypoxia. Uh, his team is saying, you most certainly did. You're just refusing to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. The judge said, well, here's the law. No. You're going to have to get nitrogen uh, hypoxia prepared before you execute this person because you can't put him to death via lethal injection because he applied for this. So, mm -hmm. sorry. So his execution is not happening on Thursday because they're not prepared to actually do it. Right. So he has a little stay here while they work on getting their uh, ducks in a row. Here's the thing. It's never been done. Not on purpose anyway. Yeah. People have died by nitrogen hypoxia uh, in plants and things like that on accident. Mm -hmm. People have died by nitrogen hypoxia uh, via suicide. But as far as doing it on purpose uh, to a death penalty uh, candidate has not been done. Yeah. It poses a really big problem because how do they test it? Can't. They can't. The only way to test it is on people. And they can't do that. So it leaves the states without very many options. So that just left me wondering, how is this even being approved and put on the books if we don't even know how to do it? Right. Because what we do know is nitrogen hypoxia will definitely kill you and kill mm -hmm. you quickly. What they don't know is how to carry it out. Should this be some kind of a gas chamber? Should this be some kind of a hood or a face mask? We don't know. Part mm -hmm. of the appeal is that it's bloodless, meaning they don't have to run a line. Yeah. So back in it. June, yeah. So back in June, uh, Alabama put someone to death. They could not get a line. They could not. They literally tried for hours to get IVs placed. Finally had to do a procedure on this man to get a central line going in order to uh, put him to death. And it took hours and hours. Then the death itself took hours. It was a really terrible situation. And again, a, a yet another violation of the Constitution for these things to happen. So that's kind of where things sit in Alabama. And I'm guessing why the judge was like, yeah, feeling pretty squeamish about this. So we're waiting, you know, mm -hmm. um, and also, frankly, just following the laws it's written in their state. So right. what do we know about nitrogen hypoxia? So it was a law professor, actually, named Michael Copeland. He is the former assistant attorney general of a tiny Pacific island called Palau. Mm -hmm. And he's a prof uh, pr professor of criminal justice at East Central University in Oklahoma. And he is the brains behind the bill written in Oklahoma that made Oklahoma uh, adopt this as a potential way to uh, carry out death penalties in 2015. They still haven't done it, too, because they, too, do not have a carrier for mm -hmm. it. So they still don't know. So in the positive or the possible, uh, you know, affirmatives to doing this, the thought is that they would start you off breathing oxygen 
and then just start basically turning a dial and you would have less and less oxygen and more and more nitrogen. He says that within 15 seconds, you would feel somewhat uh, intoxicated. Within 30 seconds, you would be completely unconscious. And within three minutes, you would be dead. Sounds good, right? I yeah, guess. How does he know that? I mean, that's, <laughs> I'm how sure that he know that. Mathematics, you know, lots of equations it's and stuff. But. Mathematics and it's... Uh, just hypotheticals based on people dying by accident. Mm -hmm. Both. The problem is the person who wrote the bill is a law professor. The people who passed the bill are politicians. The people who have not fully weighed in on the bill are doctors. And doctors, mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of research and articles out there from doctors saying this is a really bad plan. And depending on so many factors of like the size of the person and how many, you know, how deep their breaths are and so many different factors, how many unknowns that we have, you can't just start just doing this to people. But Al Alabama says, hold our beer. We're doing mm -hmm. this. So they're actively. Yeah, really trying have a choice because they've put it into law. Yeah. And now this guy has chosen it. Interestingly, though, so has Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And here's the, the other problem is that the guy that Alabama put to death back in June that had all the complications, yeah. he also chose nitrogen hypoxia. And they said, sorry, can't do it. So we're doing this and it turned out very badly. So I guess I have a lot of questions about, yes, yeah, the law. But no one seems to be enforcing the law. Once someone's already put to death, it seems like the Department of Justice in that state can be sued, but nothing's really coming from it. Like, it seems to me like they're pretty much doing whatever the hell they want anyway. That's just my opinion. But at any rate, this judge is trying to hold them to it. It's possible that here in the next few months, we are going to see Alabama be the first month or the first uh, country the first state in the nation to actually pull off an execution by nitrogen hypoxia. And we'll see how it goes. Mm. It's interesting. It's interesting that prisoners, uh, and it's not just this state, this is happening in a few different states are choosing it because it seems like it will be less painful than the alternative, even though they don't actually know, it still seems like right. a better the option. Hypotheticals are in the bill. So mm -hmm. they they're going, Oh, well, this sounds much better. Mm -hmm. We don't even know if that's true. Yeah, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on this and see where it goes. And if this is a new wave in executions, it's possible. If one state does it and they're successful, other states are going to follow suit because nitrogen gas is much, much cheaper and easier to get. And it would take away a lot of the... Uh, the stigmas and the issues that they're having right now. It's interesting. It is. It's terrifying also. It's yeah, just it so is. barbaric to me. Mm -hmm. Just. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. For sure. Mm. One of the worries is how safe is this for the people administering it? Right. Like you can't be in the room with him. Can you? <laughs> you know? it could Unless he's you in too. like a pod or something that is sealed. That's what I wondered about. It's pods. There are these pods mm -hmm. now in the UK that people can, uh, for assisted suicides, so people enter the pod and when they're ready, they push the button. And I think it actually might be nitrogen hypoxia. I, I think some of them are, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, they seem to be working quite well. That's the other thing. I think there's more studies on this uh, in other countries that the U.S. may just have to pull from to yeah. get the info they need in order to start uh, start doing these. Utah has one death penalty coming up, and it thus far is scheduled to be carried out by firing squad. Except they because can't. it's still on their books, and that's what the uh, that's what the the guy chose. The guy chose. So yeah. they're still working out the deets on that. 
I don't know. It just seems to me that maybe the very clear message here is that we should stop executing people. It sure maybe this just be. isn't the right way to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah. We have some states really desperate to make it happen. Oh, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. So there you have it. So with that, I'm going to kick the mic back over to you for our main case. Yes. Well, if you didn't see it in the news quite yet, you will be glad to know that uh, the package killer from the early 90s has been caught. His name is Gary Muehlberg. Let me show you a picture of Gary. This is Gary now on the left side and on the right side is him back when years and years ago when he first went to prison because Gary's in prison for murder right now. Mm -hmm. He's in prison for the murder of this guy right here. So the package killer killed five ish women between 1990 and 1991. And I'm going to tell you about those, but we didn't know that he did until just barely, but what did what we, what we do know is that in February of 1993, uh, Muehlberg went to prison for life after he killed a man named Kenneth Atchison. And so this is Kenneth, this is Kenneth Atchison. In a very strange, I don't know, this guy's all over the map because what he was doing was murdering sex workers before and leaving them in they, their bodies were all packaged up like they were in a box or they were in a trash can or they were one was between two mattresses that was held together by um, co coat hangers. But they were all like packaged up and left on the side of the road. And that's how he got the name, the package killer. Well, no one had connected him to these women who had gone missing. And I'll talk about them in just a minute. But then there was Keith uh, Kenneth Doc Atchison. And um, Muehlberg and Atchison actually knew each other and um, lived in the same community, had known each other fairly well. Uh, Kenneth went to Muehlberg's house to buy a car, a 1987 Cadillac. And this was in 93. And he was selling the car for $6,000 cash. But uh, Atchison just disappeared. He didn't come home with the car. He didn't, nothing happened. Well, <laughs> Muehlberg and Atchison both went to, they were both drywall contractors. And so they kind of went, worked on the same jobs and they knew each other. And when Atchison disappeared, the cops were kind of like, ah, $6,000 will buy you a lot. He's probably just in Vegas. He probably just ran off for a while. You know, mm -hmm. because that's always so successful with the police. Sure. This is always the way to go. Yeah. And the police, you know, the family, Atchison's family were like, will you please go over to Muehlberg's house? Because he was supposed yeah. to be there. Duh. Well, eventually they did. And well, well, well. Yeah, imagine. So eventually they did. Um, it took them about six weeks to do that. What? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, the, we, the reason he got caught, Neilberg, is because, well, around six weeks after uh, Atchison went missing, Neilberg asks a friend of his to come help him move a box into the basement. Oh, good Lord. Well, the box was a coffin, and Atchison's feet were sticking out of it. Like, it was not, it was not a secret at all. Oh that my there God. This was a body to be moved into Mielberg's basement, right? So at this point, Good Lord. he's cooked, you know, he's in big trouble. And so, so the, the friend, friend actually to, speaks up. Yeah, the friend actually goes to the police and is like, hey, uh, yeah, this kind of weird thing happened. I'm, I think you should go check on him. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe. So they did, and he was arrested. Oh. And he was convicted of first degree murder and he went to prison in 1995 for life. 
<laughs> he thought his friend would keep this a secret, I guess. I guess, yeah. Oh. I don't know. Not the sharpest tool in the shed at this point, I'm going to yeah. say. But prior to all of this, and, and he had not even been a suspect for being the package killer. But let me tell you about his victims, because I think this is more important than anything, is to know about these women. Because they have been missing from society for, a, you know, their bodies have all been found. Yeah. Nobody's known what's happened to them for a really long time. Yeah. So this is his first murder victim, although he did have a rape victim even earlier than this. This is Robin Meehan. She was 18. And so all of the women disappeared from a stretch of road in St. Louis known as the Stroll. And the Stroll was kind of where um, sex workers were strolling, mm -hmm. basically. And so she was only 18. And she was working as a sex worker. She also had children, a couple of children. She went missing on March 22nd of 1990. And um, a few, a while later, her body was found packaged. Weirdly, this is how they sort of re recognized it all. She was the one between the two mattresses, just sort of on the side of the road. With her body was a condom wrapper. And the police wisely kept a hold of that condom wrapper, and it is what broke this entire case open. Wow. So not long after her, his next victim, this was in May of 1990, Brenda Pruitt. This is Brenda. Brenda Pruitt also was a sex worker working on the stroll. And she was 27. Um, she was missing for 10 months before her body was found. Um, and she was in a big brown 33 gallon uh, trash can. And a jogger noticed a bad smell in like a weedy area or along a path and they found her body. Mm -hmm. She also had children um, it took them a long time to identify her because she was so uh, decomposed. They had, a, you know, there's, there's only one unknown uh, victim in this case, which I think is pretty amazing considering. Uh, then Donna Reitmeyer, this is Donna. And she, let's see. She was 40. Also working on the stroll as a sex worker, had children, you know, these, these, these women had families. Are they, you know, regardless of what you think of them having addiction problems and, and working as sex workers, they were mothers with family members who have missed them all this time. Um, she worked with another woman who they kind of kept tabs on each other and she never met up when they were supposed to and she never came home. And she was missing, let's see, she was, she was only missing for a few days. She was also found in a big, like, Rubbermaid trash can. Um, a pedestrian found her on a sidewalk. So this guy didn't have any qualms about leaving bodies out. Like, he wanted them to be found. But at the time, forensics just wasn't what it could have, you know, what it is now. Yeah. So then three months later, in September of 1990, Sandy Little, who was 21, also a sex worker working on the stroll, and she had a new baby. Aww. This is her. Um, she had a really rough early life. Her dad died when she was little, and um, the five kids with a single mom. Um, she was in and out of foster care, group homes, and her mother's house. She had a lot of challenges growing up, um, but she was definitely loved and 
um, you know, her family knew that she would not have left her child. Sure. And so she was found. Uh, let's see. She was found in a wooden box on the shoulder of Interstate 70. Oh, man. So let's see. So those were all victims that we know of. Mm -hmm. um, there is actually one Jane Doe that he has admitted to now, but they don't know who she is. They haven't been able, they don't know which, what body that is. There's, they're still working on that. I mean, this literally just happened like two right. days ago. Uh, but well, it's been in the works for a while, but it was just released. So what happened is that, uh, they, they were doing some DNA. They, there's a, there's been a detective that's been on this case since 2008 mm -hmm. and, and she just, every once in a while, she just runs the DNA from that condom wrapper, mm -hmm. um, through the system again, over and over again. Yeah. And finally there'd been, they did some DNA in the prison system. And so mm -hmm. his, because I'm not sure that his DNA had been in the system. It hadn't been in the system before, but then all of mm -hmm. a sudden it was. So they identify him in the condom wrapper in that first, in that first murder. Mm -hmm. And they go to him and he immediately fesses up to three of the murders. Wow. And then he says, if you, cause they weren't all in the same. Well, yeah, I think they were. That what he did is he negotiated with them that I will I will plead guilty and I will say everything I've done if you'll guarantee me that I won't get the death penalty because he's already in prison for life. Right. So that agreement was made. And so now he has actually confessed to five murders. We have four victims. There is another victim that is questionable. That's always been thought that she may be one of his, but it hasn't been mm -hmm. identified to be his yet. Mm -hmm. But. Every one of these women still have family living, their children particularly, and siblings who are really grateful to at least have an identity, to have a, a face to the situation. And, you know, he's never getting out of prison. He's never going anywhere. But it's, you know, it's the thing that is happening over and over again with DNA technology is that these serial killers from the late 80s, early 90s, and, and in the 70s as well, if, if the... Um, forensic evidence was maintained like it should be, um, are, are being identified. So it, wow. it's, it's good news, at least for the families, I think. And I just think we're going to continue to see more of this. Um, Gary Muehlberg is 73. He has a fair amount of remorse and refers to this as a very bad time in his life. I mean, not that that makes up for what he's done, but a lot of serial killers have no remorse at all. No empathy, nothing. Mm -hmm. And this guy seems to have a little bit more um, than others. Yeah. So on Monday, uh, he was charged with four new counts of first degree murder for Robin Meehan, Brenda Pruitt, Donna Reitmeyer, and Sandy Little. And they're trying to figure out who the fifth one is. To also bring some closure to that. Yeah. But, uh, I think it's, I think it's sobering news, but it's also at least something for their families. To Definitely. Have some knowledge of who did this. Mm -hmm. And he's locked up and he can't ever hurt anybody again. And so yeah. that's good news too. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. So there you go. The package killer has been caught. Gary Muehlberg. Amazing. Yeah. It's crazy because he was he was never suspected. There no. was never any question that they, he was not a part of any of the investigations leading up to now. Wow. Yeah. Well, so, good, on, good on their families and on that detective for getting this unraveled. Yeah, good she's for really, their families to get some kind of closure here. But yeah, the detective on this case has really fought since 2008. She just mm -hmm. keeps like rerunning that DNA, knowing what's happening right yeah. now. You know that that is technology gets better. At some point. Something is. Yep. Yeah, it finally did. Wow. 
Well, I know you're going to wrap us up with a WTF news. Yes. Well, WTF, are you ready for a little stroll down memory lane? (laughs) Sure. This Arizona Barbie is (laughs) Melanie Pulowski. Mm Mm-hmm. Who is Melanie Pulowski? Well, she is the niece of Lori Vallow. Yes. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background into Melanie. Sorry for the barking dog. I'm going to yell at him. Hold on. (laughs) If you're just listening and not watching, Katie is silent. She's muted herself, so she can yell at her dog. It's pretty great. I don't think it's helping, though, to be honest. (laughs) It's it's happy barks. This is what happens. The other dogs get wrestling and playing, uh-huh. and this is how he plays with. He bounces along beside them, barking like this. So mm-hmm. he's kind okay. of the referee. I yeah. think this is this is Bruno having fun, but <laughs> it gets to be a little much. Anyway, <laughs> but let's talk about Mustard Mel. Okay, <laughs> so Melanie Pulowski, of course, is Lori's niece. Melanie, you'll hear her name a lot in the. Uh, Lori Vallow story of sorts because she's yes. been around a lot. She moved to Rexburg. She met her now husband here. Alex tried to murder her soon to be ex husband mm-hmm. once upon a time. Melanie was arrested and uh, convicted of trespassing when her ex, Brandon Boudreaux, was trying to hide his children from her because he felt like they weren't safe. Oh, you know, about the same time that Tylee and JJ were being murdered and buried in Chad's backyard. Yeah. Melanie's been all over this shit Mm -hmm. all this time. She has. And there's a lot of people that feel like Melanie knows more than uh, we think. There's been a lot of people that think she must have some kind of an immunity agreement because she's a witness uh, on every witness statement we've seen. She was a grand jury witness. She'll be a witness at trial. She's mm-hmm. been all over this. And there's been a lot of, uh, you know, conjecture about how involved it's Melanie. Mm-hmm. Well, Melanie and Brandon got divorced. And when Melanie and Brandon got divorced, it dragged on for a while and was yeah. very, very contentious. And Brandon's attorneys have been amazing, honestly, mm-hmm. and have I think likely saved the lives of his children by not backing down and by keeping them safe from all of this ilk until, uh, you know, the time that Lori and Chad, you know, were found out and both went to jail and, you know, some good separation happened and and they have still Mm. fought to keep these children safe. Well, during the course of the divorce, Melanie's attorney's name is Garrett Smith. Garrett Smith, you should know his name, or you might if you know this case very well. We've heard Garrett Smith's name in a few different uh, instances. Mm -hmm. He's also the attorney for Zulima Pastenis, Alex's widow Mm -hmm. and Lori's best friend, one of Lori's best friends. Uh, And I believe also the attorney for Lori's sister, Summer. Yeah. So he's been representing all of these guys. Uh, We think that he's a member of their church. Mm -hmm. Uh, We we tracked that back and we're quite sure that he's a a member of the LDS church and he's a member of their ward or their, you know, Mm -hmm. their immediate church. And that's how they know him. Well, during the course of the divorce, Garrett Smith found it prudent to release a statement about Brandon Boudreaux and his family that was really inflammatory. And I'm not going to repeat it because they're litigious uh, for good reason. And it wasn't true. It was just some really terrible accusations that were totally unfounded. Yep. About uh, who he was and who his family is totally unfounded. And Brandon and his (coughs) attorneys filed (coughs) against Garrett Smith. Right. Personally for those statements that he had made in the media and settled with him to the tune of $12 million. So when the news broke today that Melanie Pulowski has now been charged with another crime, this time uh, computer tampering, Mm -hmm. I'll I'll tell you the whole thing here in a minute. Um, 
I was kind of shocked to see that Garrett Smith is still her attorney. I can't believe that. Melanie, what the hell is wrong with you? I mean, six ways to Sunday, what the hell is wrong yeah, with you? Yeah, that's a, that's a long but, list. But seriously? All right, so hopefully that answered a few questions about who Melanie is. Uh, but let's talk about what she's being charged with. She's being charged with a class three felony for computer tampering in Mesa. So <coughs> what did she do? Well, when they got divorced, she was removed from Brandon's business. He has a consulting business, uh, Cougar Consulting, and she was removed from that and had to be removed from the bank account, uh, the name of the business, all of those things within 30 to 60 days after the divorce was final. <coughs> mm -hmm. Well, months after the divorce was final, she logged into the business's bank account and made a copy of a check that was in, to the amount of $12,000 that had been paid to Brandon and gave that to her attorney to use to try to fight for more child support because she felt like she was entitled to a portion of that check. Here's the problem. She had no business access <coughs> to that bank account. She was supposed to be completely removed from that. Well, also, she's having no, no contact with the kids. Why is mm -hmm. she getting child support? Right. Well, and on paper, she was removed from that bank account. Apparently, Brandon had perhaps not changed the password mm. or the login information. Uh, but that still didn't give her the right to access it. No. So his attorneys, of course, are like, wait a damn minute. Where in the world did you get this check? So, of course, they recognize that she got it by accessing a bank account that she was not supposed to have access to. And they decided that, yeah, this is, uh, it's akin to identity theft, basically. Mm -hmm. And she has been charged. Well, now I have to tell you, the detective in the probable cause, uh, and then in the police report, the detective that uh, investigated this said, Garrett Smith told me it's not Melanie's fault that Brandon was dumb and did not change the login information until three days after Melanie accessed the online account. Oh, That's boy. what her attorney said. That he wants sounds to about again. right. <laughs> but also, I'm sorry, but who's dumb? Yeah. Why do you still have this attorney, Melanie? What are you right. thinking? Yeah. But whatever. I don't care if you have good representation, really. But. But what a fool. What? Yeah. That's the answer? Is that what you're going to tell the judge, too, bud? Really? Yeah. Okay. Do it. Hopefully it's streamed. Because I really want to see that. Right. Yeah. There will be some very um, unimpressed. Mm -hmm. Very unimpressed judge in that situation. Mm-hmm. So her next hearing is set for September 26th. Uh, a sentence for a class three felony could result in probation and up to one year in jail uh, or two to 8.75 years in prison. It's probably not going to go that far, uh, except for that she does, of course, have that pesky little criminal record in Utah for the press trespassing with the domestic violence enhancement in November 2018, right. when, of course, the police had to drag her away from ba Brandon Boudreaux's parents' house. So she does have priors, which isn't going to help her right now. Right. However, she is a mother with a baby. And mm -hmm. so are they really going to put her in prison? I seriously doubt it. However, good on Brandon and squad that they are keeping this woman to account. Yeah. This is how we keep her from becoming the next Lori Vallow. Yeah, it is. The police actually listen and respond. Mm -hmm. Attorneys actually do their due diligence. Mm -hmm. The public actually holds her accountable. Yeah. That's how, because those are the things that did not happen with Lori. Right? Not at all. And and who knows if this is just the beginning with Melanie? Oh, uh, yeah. Because there are a lot of questions <clears throat> here in Idaho about what she knew and what she did and what she participated in. 
A hundred percent. Yeah. But uh, that broke just today and I found it very interesting. And I felt like as listeners, all of you guys that are following the Day Valo case would find this really interesting as well. It seems mm-hmm. like all of the players in this case, um, except for Zulema, cannot stop getting in trouble or, you know, making waves for themselves. So mm-hmm. going to be interesting. Yeah, it so is. we'll definitely keep an eye on it and keep you posted. For sure. So there you have it. All right. Well, that's it. This is our Wednesday case. We will be back tonight with live case updates. Right after live case updates, we will be doing our um, <clears throat> true crime cold read party that we do once a month for our mm-hmm. subscribers on YouTube. And so we just ask you to bring your favorite cold case and a little, little synopsis of what the case is. And we'll do a read on it and tell you what we think happened. So don't forget that next week there will be some surprise episodes coming out. We will not be here live except for Katie will be here for case updates on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. Um, But they will be episodes that you may or may not have seen before. We're taking a little break and then we'll be back the following week with bells on. Better than ever. Yes. Yes. So you know it. Like, subscribe, share, comment. Go check us out on Patreon. We are True Crime Squad on Patreon. We put out two extra episodes a month over there. There are lots of ways to get involved with us. So find your favorite one. And you know it. We are the True Crime Squad. Thanks for being here. Take care.